thank you for being here. And I also want to thank John and Vince for uh, creating this conference again and again and again. It's really, really important for us, all of us to be able to come together and, and talk about these issues and help build this technology. It's really been a grassroots movement for many, many years. I also want to uh, thank Gordon for putting the videos online. Uh, before I came to the first conference, I watched uh, many, many videos, many hours of video that uh, Gordon had recorded. And I think uh, also, you know, we are 100 people here maybe or something, but there are many more watching at home. And we have to remember that we are, we are part of a big community. Uh, I also want to uh, thank Kirk Sorensen uh, for, in the beginning, he was one of the people who really got this going. Um, and I'm... Yes, I'm, I'm really proud to be part of that uh, legacy and, and try to do my part and our part in coping atomics to, uh, to move forward. Rusty made a really nice introduction about why uh, we need to solve these problems uh, in the world with energy and clean water and all that. Uh, we summarize this with this uh, slogan on the back of our t-shirt. Most, most of the team members have these t-shirts. Uh, they wear them every day at the workshop, so it, it's really nice. Uh, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback uh, from that. Um, so I think some of you have seen this before. It's the energy consumption of the world, and you see that nuclear, the orange one, is not very big. Wind and solar is even smaller. So the, the, the question you want to ask yourself, where do you think it's going to go in the next 50 years? Is it going to go up like it had, has the last 100 years, or is it going to go down because we choose as humans to spend less energy. Uh, so can we have a show of hands who think it's going to go up? Okay, and how many thinks it's going to go down? Okay, w one guy, all right. Uh, I will, uh, so I will say, say to you, if we have to go down like it shows here, we probably have to kill two billion people. I have my own guesses here about how it's going to look in the next 40 years. You know, this is what we think. All of you are, can have your own opinion. Nobody knows exactly uh, what it's going to look like. Um, earlier this week, I was at the Molensor Reactor uh, workshop at Oak Ridge, and, and now we've been here for, for two days. And I think we have to remember uh, why thorium is important, because sometimes it gets lost in all this debate about uranium. Uh, thorium is the only element that can make a breeder reactor in thermal spectrum, and this is super important super important and we sometimes forget that and I just want to remind you and everybody at home but it's not enough with thorium you need a molten salt reactor where you can remove the fission products otherwise you can't have a breeder reactor and so molten salt reactors and thorium they go together and they're a really important concept and you, you can't just use one of them I mean you, you can if you want to make research and do the first steps towards developing this technology but if you really want to have a very very large deployment of nuclear energy, you need both of them. Uh, and of course, the last thing, we will not run out of thorium. Um, so coping atomics is all about making molten salt reactors, and especially thorium reactors on assembly lines, or mass manufacturing. And we had this idea all the way back from when we started the company back in 2014, that we must be able to mass manufacture this like we do with cars and airplanes. And we have a plan to make these assembly lines where we can make one reactor every day. And that reactor is a 100 megawatt thermal reactor. Uh, it fits inside roughly the size of a 40 foot shipping container. Uh, and we can deploy them and install them uh, all over the world. But I'm going to come back to what are the most important markets for us. But before that, I just want to summarize quickly what is, what is Copenhagen Atomics all about in sort of five simple bullet points. The first one is that we've developed a technology over these last eight years where we believe that we can provide energy at a lower cost than any other energy system, any other. And why is that important? That's important because price is king. If you can provide something at a lower cost than the other guys, they will oftentimes select you. Next important thing is that we can take spent fuel from old reactors and reuse that, and we can get 10 times more energy out of that fuel once we use it again in a coming atomics waste burner. And that is phenomenal. I mean, think about other energy systems. Can you think of something where you can take the exhaust from another energy system and get 10 times more energy out of it? It's like unthinkable. And this is what we're dealing with here. We're, we have a unique technology uh, sort of between our hands and between all of us. And we, we have to make sure that this technology gets to the market. It's so vital 
for human prosperity. Um, also, Kuming Atomics is, is different than many of the other uh, nuclear energy vendors because many of them are selling reactors, but we want to sell energy. We want to build, own, and operate the reactors. We believe that's a way to get to lower cost. We will also decommission the reactors afterwards. And this means that essentially we're selling energy as a service. And I want to reveal something else that, I mean, sometimes people ask me, can you throttle the reactor run at half power? Yeah, we can do that, but you're still going to pay for full power because, <laughs> because the, the reactor is such that we actually make more money in the long term if it's running at full power. So you don't get a rebate. I mean, you, you essentially pay twice as much for your electricity if you run at 50%. So that, in that respect, we are probably also different. Um, so what is Copenhagen Atomics? We're actually already building a reactor in Copenhagen. And I think that's super cool. And the rest of the team thinks so too. I mean, we're not just sitting around and doing paper design and talking about how this could be done and trying to optimize something. We're actually building it. And we have been building stuff for many years. And I will show you a lot of pictures on that later in my slide. But we are really, really proud that we've actually started building a reactor. And then the long-term goal, you probably know that Facebook has a, a billion subscribers and Google has shipped more than a billion Android phones. There's not yet a company in the world that has supplied green energy to a billion people, and we want to be that company. Uh, it's gonna be really tough, and I hope that we can do this before I die. It's gonna be a really long journey, but we wanna try. All right, so um, lots of people ask me all the time, so, so where are you going to install these reactors and what are they going to be used for? And I've made this table sort of to, to start that dialogue because uh, it, it's a dialogue that I've had hundreds of times. Th this table is not complete, but I've just listed four of them. So you can build reactors on land, so new built reactors on land, or you can retrofit old power plants, typically coal-fired power plants, or you can put them on barges. There's a couple of companies doing that. Uh, or you could put uh, nuclear reactors on ships like they do with uh, aircraft carriers and submarines. And, and there's talks about doing that for commercial ships. And there's also a couple of companies uh, focusing on putting reactors on ship. And from a technical standpoint, it's all possible. No, no doubt about it. But when we sort of look at the cost of these different deployment, uh, there's a very di big difference between putting a new built large reactor on, the, on, on land uh, compared to, for example, putting it on a ship. And we have to remember that. It, it actually matters where the reactor goes. Uh, and we, it also matters how big that market is. And there are some estimates there of the market size. I mean, the, the, the market size for new build is huge. And there's only so many coal fire power plants where you can replace it. Oftentimes, they are close to the city. And you know, it, it's, it's got to be custom integrated every time. So it's not easy to do. like mass deployment and we are really about, all about something where you can deploy a reactor every day that's not easy if you have to customize it for a specific site or a specific ship or something okay our reactors can be used in all these types of deployments but the one that we really like is the first one new build on land and uh, and of course uh, we believe that we can deploy it much faster there um, there's also a lot of discussions about about uranium versus thorium and even discussions about low enriched uranium versus HALU and all this. Uh, of course, I cannot go in details with all this. This is a, a very deep and long discussion. But I've tried to make sort of a, a very simple slide here uh, with three different columns. There's the first column is the coming atomics waste burner. Then there's the uranium molten salt reactor, sort of what people call generation four reactors. And then finally, there's the uranium light water reactors, which are the, the most well-known reactor out there. So I thought those were the best ones to compare. So you have to understand with thorium, you can get thorium right out of the ground. We already mine for other materials where we get thorium out of the ground, but we don't use it. We put it, put it back in the ground, but we could just refine that thorium and use it in a reactor. We don't need to enrich it or anything. But on the contrary, if you want to use uranium, you have to mine roughly 100 times more material out of the ground. That costs a lot of money to haul all that material out of the ground. You have to ship it somewhere. You have to... Uh, refine it, you have to, you know, you have to turn it into uranium hexafluoride and enrich it. And it has to be a really, really clean product before you can run it through that enrichment. The enrichment facilities are very expensive, both to build and operate. Just the fuel uh, supply is a hundred times more expensive for uranium than it is for thorium once we get up to scale. 
So already there, I mean, we're sort of on a completely different scale of things. And then of course, the, the waste products, if you're a waste burner, you, you basically end up with uh, fission products, which only needs to be stored for roughly 300 years. Whereas with the uranium reactors, you, you have to do something with the fuel that comes out of those reactors before you can dispose of it. Or if you just dispose it, I mean, maybe 100,000 years. Again, the energy price, because we can load a Kickstarter fuel up front, and then we, we have a breeder reactor. I'll show you some uh, pictures later on. So you load 180 kilograms of Kickstarter fuel on day one, and then you can run that reactor for 50 years, and you only have to refuel with thorium. I mean, this is amazing stuff. It's not like these uh, light water reactors where you have to refuel every 18 months or something and have to be down for a long time and you have to have all these employees that are trained and uh, yeah, so much trouble. Just run for them, it's much easier. And of course, if you can build them in an, on an assembly line and when they come out of that assembly line, they are quality assured. The, the whole box is completely gas tight and sealed and you ship it out to the place where you, where you want to run it and out there you load the Kickstarter fuel it, you, can, you can really deploy one every day. It's completely different than these light water reactors that takes you know, sometimes more than 10 years to build. And of course, also the pressure at the bottom. I mean, the, the pressure is what allows us to make them small, basically. And this is also really, really important. And uh, oftentimes this is completely forgotten in the sort of when people talk about nuclear uh, and especially advanced reactors. So how much energy you need to invest to build these systems before you can actually start to to get the energy back from running those systems. And with wind and solar, uh, it's, it's, um, it's not a very good investment. But of course, it's possible, it's doable. But this is why wind and solar will never grow to 50% of global energy. Um, the hydrocarbons are a little bit better. Light water reactors is, of course, the winner today. But look at the waste burner that we have. We use very little steel, very little concrete compared to a, a light water reactor on the same amount of energy produced. So we are in a completely different ball game. And this is, of course, also the reason why the price that we can manufacture it at a lower price and manufacture it much faster. All right, so that was sort of a little bit of an introduction to why thorium energy and why uh, waste burners. Now I'm going to talk about some of the milestones and show you some of the pictures of things we've done in Cobham Megatomics. Uh, we've already built the first non-fission prototype of our uh, first reactor and tested that with water. Right now, we are building the next one that we're going to test with FLENAC, a non-radioactive salt, in the beginning of next year. Uh, and we currently have set up salt production lines where we can produce one ton of FLENAC every month. And we are getting close to scaling that to two tons every month. Nobody else in the world has that. And if I should really brag about it, the salt that we produce at this one ton per month is more clean than some of the samples we, we can get from other uh, competitors at 100 gram scale. We have figured out a way to make a process to make really clean salt. And this is where we can use stainless steel 316. We, we don't see a lot of corrosion if we have really clean uh, salt. And, uh, but it has also taken us four years to develop that process. And I can tell you the most difficult thing was actually to measure consistently how clean it is or uh, so that you can reproduce those measurements again and again. And, and we're going to set up, next year, we're going to set up a thorium production line where we can produce thorium salt. The maximum capacity of that new production line is 100 tons of thorium and 10 tons of uranium. Nobody else in the world has molten salt production facilities at that scale. So we're really pr uh, proud of that. Um, uh, yeah, and then of course, uh, we, we plan to be able to start the reactor and run it also similar to Rusty in 2025 and load the fissile Kickstarter fuel. And finally, we believe that in 2028, we will be able to have the first commercial reactor online. So what does it look like? Uh, the design has changed a little bit. So basically it's a reactor inside a 40 foot shipping container and it's completely airtight and sealed. And if you want to put one gigawatt at one location, you put 25 of these reactors next to each other in a long row inside a typical uh, industrial building. In our case, in our reactor design, we have three barriers between the fuel salt and nature. And the, the third barrier is actually around each reactor. So the building itself is not part of the safety barrier. The building is just there to you know, keep uh, birds out and uh, dust and such and so on. Um, I want to talk a little bit about spent nuclear fuel because that's also some of the questions we get again and again. But so the, up in the left-hand corner, the, uh, the drum there is an icon to represent the spent fuel. You take that and if you look inside that drum, 
95% of all the atoms in there are uranium, and it's exactly the same uranium atoms as what we got out of the ground through mining 20 or 30 years earlier. They hasn't changed at all. So of course, if we could separate those, we could put them back into nature and they would be natural as everything else. But of course, the difficult thing is to make that separation. Um, but we actually don't think that we're going to put, put them back in nature. We think that the global uranium market will be happy to buy uh, all these separate uranium. So that's why we say, say that we send it back to the global uranium market. The last 5% is the dirty stuff. That are the fission products and the transuranics. And we need to separate those. And the fission products, we can, we can send away for storage right away. And the last roughly 1%, a little bit more, is the transuranics. And all that dirty stuff, the plutonium, the neptunium, the curium, all that stuff, we put into our reactor and burn that. And it's, that is what helps us start the thorium fuel cycle. And at the same time, we split all those heavy atoms and turn them into fission products that we later can store. Okay, a little bit about our development philosophy in coming atomics. You know that there are probably 20 molten salt reactor companies around the world. And uh, most of those have chosen in the more traditional route where you do a paper design. And once you have sort of completed your paper design, then you go for approval and later on you start building it. We thought we wanted to do it differently because we believe in order to optimize these processes and understand this new technology, we need to have rapid uh, technology cycles. And we wanted to do that with non-radioactive materials and without doing tons of paperwork. So we just started doing that basically from day one or actually even before we founded the company, we started tinkering in the lab um, and we built systems. And many of you probably know that we've built <laughs> very many systems and tested a lot of things and we've learned a lot. Okay, so uh, just a little bit of uh, fun facts about the, the company. Uh, we are roughly 60 people now and we have already done accumulated 70 years of testing of all types of components. And uh, I was at the Moldsall Reactor Conference uh, earlier this week and I, I asked other people, like, how many years do you think you've tested? And most of them said, Ma, we, we, we don't even have one year of accumulated testing yet. Uh, so 70 years is really cool. This is the team. This picture is a little bit old, so the team is bigger now, but there's most of the team you can see they're wearing the, the same t-shirt as I have. Here are some examples of some of the test systems that we are building. These are sort of the, the two images there on the right is sort of a picture taking into the furnace part of the system. The one in the middle, there's two heat exchangers and a pump and some valves and a filter and a reheater. And, and at the bottom, you see sort of this square tank with the salt inside. And when we, when we run these systems, we put the tank under pressure so that the salt goes up into the pump so that it primes and then we just start pumping. And, and once we turn off the pump, the salt just drains back into the uh, tank. And of course, we only want to use the same principle in our reactor. It works really, really well. And on the, on the right hand side, there's an example of a filter system where we have two tanks and we filter salt from one to the other. And the left image is some of the guys uh, playing with the systems. Here is uh, here's, uh, some images of the salt production systems. Uh, the, the one there on the left is actually uh, lithium fluoride, thorium fluoride. So a real thorium salt. In the middle, we have a FLENAC. And on the right side, we have the canisters. That's how we are now manufacturing the salt. Uh, and this is also what we sell to universities and national labs around the world uh, to help them uh, build molten salt systems. We have built a lot of electronic systems and sensors because, for example, when you have a reactor and you have all this radiation, it can uh, endure bit flips and resets and reboots and stuff like that. So in our system, we've developed a, a new type of software that where the software runs massively parallel so that it runs on 50 computers at the same time. The exact same software run on 50 computers and then they vote on, uh, in each iteration, they vote on and see if they agree on the uh, on the action of the reactor in the next step. And it's, it's highly unlikely that all these uh, hundreds of CPUs will have the same bit flip at the same time. So therefore, the statistics of doing it in this way is really good. And therefore, we can use sort of consumer electronics instead of this super expensive uh, nuclear hardened electronics. And here's another example of some of the sensors and electronics that we're building. We have more than 30 different types of uh, electronics and sensor components. Uh, here's a product that we're really, really proud of. We started back in uh, 2016, I think it was, developing our own pump. And that was after talking to a number of the big pump manufacturers in Europe. First we asked them, do you have a molten salt pump? And they said, what is a molten salt pump? <laughs> uh, and then 
And then we started dialogue with them and say, can you help us develop one? And they said, it's going to cost you at least a million dollars and we don't guarantee anything. And we were like, okay, we looked in our bank account back then, you know, we were bootstrapping the company. We didn't have a million dollars in the bank. So we thought, ah, shit, what are we going to do? So we decided to develop our own pump and we're really happy today that we actually did made that choice. So at the top row there, you see the, uh, what we call the small pump. Uh, it's a pump that we only guarantee that it runs for 1,000 hours. It's for research purposes. It's for testing all these components. And uh, we've made many of those, I think some like 40 of those pumps, and we've tested them for thousands of hours. Uh, they are not good enough for running in your reactor. Clearly, 1,000 hours is not enough. Uh, so at the bottom there, you see our next generation pump, which we call the, uh, this is the active magnetic bearing pump. That means that the rotating parts inside the, the pump is levitating on a magnetic field. Uh, and then therefore there is no, no uh, touching parts and, or no uh, wear. And it's known from industry that pumps like these can run for 20 years without service. Uh, and it, so the, we've started developing that, but again, we needed to develop that for high temperature for 700 degrees. Uh, and of course, all these electronics and all these magnets and all that stuff also needs to work at 700 degrees. And that was sort of a little bit tough. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's still uh, in sort of research state. It, we, it's not ready for shipping to customers yet. Uh, but this is, a, this is a product that we're really proud of. And uh, I'm pretty sure that there's going to run for 10 years inside a reactor. Uh, so that's a, that's a cool development. Uh, on the right side there, there's a picture of one of the pumps inside a, one of the loops. Uh, here's a picture of the first uh, reactor that we are building and testing. This is the one where we test with water. On the right side, you see this uh, octagon where the reactor core is inside. In the middle, you sort of see a big wall out of stainless steel. And everything to the right of that big wall is supposed to be at 600 degrees in the real reactor. And everything to the left of that wall is supposed to be at room temperature. That's where we have the heavy water. We use heavy water as a moderator. And that's also where we have the electronics and all that. I should stress that the heavy water is not under pressure. It's at room temperature and we cool it like crazy uh, to keep it cold because of course it's, it's very close to the hot salt inside the core. Um, but we've, we've demonstrated that that works well and heavy water is a wonderful moderator. It's just the best moderator you can get. And if you want to make a breeder reactor, that's why you want to use uh, heavy water. Um, a little bit about our test loops. Uh, many of you have probably seen those uh, on some other pictures or on our website or something like that. This is the fifth generation of our test loops. We've, uh, we've had a lot of experience similar to some of the universities that it's not super easy to build uh, these test loops and have no leaks and have uh, pumps and valves and gaskets and sensors and everything work all the time. Uh, but now we've, we've developed these loops to a uh, uh, a very uh, good standard where we can actually depend on them and, and make uh, repeated experiments with the exact same results. And, and we're really happy to have those. We're also selling those test loops to uh, mostly to national labs and universities around the world. Uh, many of our customers, more than half of our customers are here in the US. And we're very proud to partner with some of the best national labs and best universities, MIT, for example. And of course, we also learn something back from them when they use our loops and test uh, things in them. The, the test loop is sort of a, uh, it has two barriers. So the first barrier is the salt barrier, the, the basic the loop inside where we circulate things. And then there's the outer wall. Uh, so everything inside the loop uh, has an argon atmosphere. And of course, there's an argon atmosphere, a cover gas and the salt, uh, circulating salt, but there's also an argon uh, in the rest of the loop. And of course, we monitor all the time the amount of moisture and oxygen in, in those. And it's really important to get down to very low level of oxygen, like you know, 10 ppm or even lower. We had to change our argon supplier because the one we had before couldn't deliver argon that was clean enough for, for what we're doing. Um, and we now have uh, 15 loops running uh, and uh, we are building 10 more loops. So, I mean, we are by far the leader in the world in testing molten salt and building these molten salt loops. Uh, we also do stat uh, static salt tests. Uh, these are what we call test tubes. They are just small little systems where we can test corrosion, gaskets, sensors, uh, different salts at different temperatures, but it's not, they're not pumped. It's just a static salt test. And okay, so this is also very important. We want to, uh, we want to uh, provide better tools for the molten salt reactor community. And we've chosen to work with um, the OpenMC 
It stands for Open Monte Carlo Simulation Tools. And just a few years ago, like five years ago, it was actually not possible for like some, some person who wants to tinker at home or a student to, to sort of design a reactor at home and, and test the neutronics. But with these tools that we've now developed and released, and they're very well equipped for simulating molten salt reactors, uh, you can actually uh, make a CAD drawing in, a, in an open source CAD tool, export that, take it into your open MC uh, simulation tools. We've provided all the tool chain for that as open source. And then you can simulate your reactor, your own perfect uh, reactor design at home. And you can sort of experiment with different dimensions to see how well that reactor will work. But not only that, the three images here that I, I show at the top row are the reactors from uh, the aircraft reactor experiment the zero power uh, reactor experiment and the molten salt reactor experiment. So existing reactors that was running back in the day at Oak Ridge, and of course we are simulating those to make sure that we can get the same uh, criticality values and everything as what they did in the real experiments because we need to make sure that our um, simulation tools, that we can trust the results that comes out of those. And all, also all these uh, CAD models of those, the MSRE and all the other reactors are available for open source if you want to download those and play with them. And we will continue to put significant efforts into this open source tool. I, I believe that we as an industry need a tool we can all share and compare results. And also the universities and national app can, can use the same thing for free, of course. So now we're going a little bit more technical uh, for those of you who are, who are engineers and who are interested in neutronics. So this chart here shows you the breacher ratio of a reactor. There's a few different combinations of reactors here. Uh, you see that uh, something called RGPU is reactor grade plutonium. And then that's of course the best one. That's the same as what you put into MOX fuel. And that's the Kickstarter fuel. If you start with this uh, plutonium that you would normally put into MOX fuel, you get a breeder reactor within three years roughly. And then if you start it on transuranics, which is the, the most dirty part of your spent fuel, then you also get a breeder reactor in roughly three years, but it's, it doesn't have as good a breeder ratio because there's many more dirty things in there to capture your neutrons. There's also the uh, LEU, which means low enriched uranium, 5% enriched uranium. If you run that in the best case, you can actually get up to a level where it's just above a breeding ratio. Uh, these simulations here are with a carbon-carbon composite core, uh, and we, we really uh, need that if we need to make a really good breeder reactor. We can use some other materials, but uh, that is our primary choice. And then finally, there's the example. The red line is the first reactor that we're going to run in 2025. It will have a stainless steel core uh, for the most part, and therefore much uh, worse neutron economy. And also, we will not separate the uh, fission products, which is another important thing. Um, so the next uh, three slides that I'm going to show is all about the neutron economy of the reactor. The first one here is the reactor grade plutonium. The chart on the left side is the, you know, which isotopes capture your neutrons. And the chart on the right side is how much material of each of those elements do you have in the reactor over the years? How do that change over the years? And you see that we start, the blue colors are plutonium. So you see that we, we, we start on plutonium and in the beginning, plutonium is capturing a lot of the neutrons, but already after, yeah, in this case here, what is that, four years, five years, you basically burned away most of that plutonium and there's very little left. And you can see the dark green color is the uranium-233. It sort of builds up over time and start capturing the neutrons. And of course, when the uranium-233 is capturing the neutrons, you also know that that's what's you know, generating your power. And all the time, the thorium is the, the orange color, the big orange color, the thorium is capturing neutrons and being you know, converted into uranium-233. If we move on to the next one, this is based on transuranics. The, the simulation on the previous page ran for 10 years, but this one only runs for seven years. And you can see that the transuranics, there's more dirty stuff in there. So it takes more years to burn away the plutonium, but eventually we will burn away the plutonium. And then the last case here is the case where we run on low enriched uranium. I don't think that there are many other uh, molten salt reactor companies that can run on low enriched uranium. I think uh, Terrestrial Energy was one of them. Uh, but uh, in general, most of the other companies want to run on HALU uh, fuel. But here you can see that even with low enriched uranium, we actually build up significant uranium-233 
and start getting the majority of energy from the uranium-233 already after two years. But of course, when we have uranium-238 in there, we also uh, generate a lot of plutonium. And that plutonium will come, you know, we will burn the plutonium as we go. You can see it's sort of steady state across the, the image there. But uh, we also generate a new plutonium all the time. So it's a very similar case to, uh, um, for example, a Kandu reactor or a light water reactor. So that was, uh, that was my quick introduction to Copenhagen Atomics.